Well, I've got a question for you this morning. Have you ever met someone whose kindness caught you by surprise? Have you ever known anyone whose character and integrity you couldn't help but admire? And to give you an idea of what I'm, I'm talking about, I, I, in, in searching for a way to demonstrate to you the kind of character I'm talking about, I came across a clip from the movie Invictus. Now, if you're not familiar with the movie Invictus, it takes place in South Africa during the presidency of Nelson Mandela. Now, in the film, it depicts Mandela reaching out to Francois Pinar, the uh, captain of the national the national South African rugby team, and he encourages him and the team to, uh, to win the, the World Cup with the hopes that that kind of victory would bring the country together, bring together a country that had long been characterized by racial tension. And so let's take a look at a clip from the movie where Francois meets Nelson Mandela for the first time and pay close attention to the behavior of Nelson Mandela. Well, since the audio is fairly quiet right now, let me explain a little bit of what's going on. That's Francis, uh, Francois Pinar. He's going in to see Nelson Mandela. The security chief has just explained to him that Nelson uh, Mandela had purchased him some British tea he had heard that he liked British tea, and so Mandela bought him some British tea. So here he is, warmly greeting Francois, uh, asking him about his recent injury. See the surprise on his face there that, that Mandela even thought to ask about his recent injury. Now here he's got one of his staff bringing in tea. He just complimented her profusely, up and down. Thanks her graciously. Yeah. So I know that most of what you just saw was my narration, but what, based on my narration, did you observe about Nelson Mandela as portrayed here by Morgan Freeman? He was humble. He was polite. He was considerate. He was courteous. And that's the kind of character that gets people's attention. That's the kind of character that people notice. And honestly, to be, to, to be completely honest, it's people like Mandela, people who demonstrate that kind of magnetic character, that kind of character that demonstrates clearly that he has concern for the feelings and the needs and the well-being of others. That kind of person makes the world a better place. And I'm not just talking about presidents or world leaders or national heroes. I'm talking about anyone who demonstrates exceptional character. That gets the world's attention and makes the world a better place. But here's the thing about people with character. The reason they get our attention, the reason that we admire them, is because they remind us of someone else. Someone who himself demonstrated remarkable compassion, remarkable consideration, reached out to the suffering and the marginalized, even went so far as to pray for people who were publicly brutalizing and humiliating him. And of course, I'm talking about Jesus. We admire character in people because good character reminds us of the only perfect human being who ever walked the earth. Good character in human beings points to God. So let's, uh, let's look at something that Jesus said regarding this subject, this idea of character getting people's attention and pointing to God. It appears in the Gospel of Matthew. It's there that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, you've probably heard this passage before, but let's take a closer look at what Jesus is saying there. He starts by saying, you are the salt of the earth. Now, keep in mind, he's not just addressing his disciples. He's addressing a mixed crowd of followers and just people who are listening in on the conversation. In effect, he is saying that human beings, as God intends, are the salt of the earth, the ones who make the world a tastier place, if you will. But then he points out that salt, if it loses its flavor, if it loses its saltiness, it's not good, it's not meaning its purpose. When sin entered into the human condition, we lost our flavor, we lost our saltiness, but thankfully, because we are followers of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can get our saltiness back. By being followers of Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit who shapes who we are on the inside, shapes our character, so that we more and more throughout our walk with Christ resemble his character. So let's see what else he says about this. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. If you have a city or a town lit up at night, especially if it's on a hill, you can't miss it. It's the same thing when human beings reflect the character of Jesus Christ. When human beings, followers of Jesus Christ, demonstrate the goodness of God in the way they live their lives, people can't miss it. He goes on to say, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. So here Jesus is saying, you know, you you don't want to hide this light shining out of you, shining through you. But you know, that's sometimes what we're tempted to do. Sometimes we're tempted to downplay that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Sometimes that means being tempted to compromise a little bit to fit in. What if people think we're strange? What if people think that we're too uptight? What if, what if, what if, what if, what are people going to think of us if we live this way when they're expecting us to live that way? But Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. Trust me, live my way in front of other people. Don't hide who you are. Don't hide that you're my follower. Don't hide that you're a Christian. Now, sure, some people may not like the way you live your life. They may roll their eyes or scoff at you. But for others, you could be a real inspiration. You could be a real example. That's what Jesus means when he talks about giving light to everyone in the house. When those around you see your integrity, see the way you treat others, see the way you reflect the character of Christ... They are experiencing the goodness of God through you. And when they recognize your good character for what it is, as Jesus says, they glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, they stop for a minute and they think, hey, maybe there's something to this Christianity thing after all. Maybe this is something I want to experience for myself. Doors open that way. Hearts open soften. The spiritual soil gets tilled and ready for seeds to be planted. People are far more open to hearing the message of Jesus Christ when they've seen a demonstration of God's life-changing power in our lives. They're also far more likely to accept an invitation to experience that life-changing power for themselves. And by the way, that is an invitation that we have all been given the responsibility to make, inviting others to experience the life-changing power of God. 
Let's take a look at how all this plays out, how this idea of, of demonstrating God's life-changing power and then inviting others to experience it, let's take a look at how that plays out in the early church. In Acts chapter 1, we find some of Jesus' last words to the very first Christians. He tells them to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. He says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be wit my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's our, mis our mission. Our mission is when we become followers of Jesus Christ, is to be sent out as his witnesses. Witnesses to what? None other than the life-changing power of God. That power that makes us the salt of the earth. That power that makes us the light of the world. So how do we go about being God's witnesses? How do we go about shining our light? Well, let's take a look at the example the early Christians give us in Acts in Acts chapter 2. We see that it starts with a demonstration of God's life-changing power. Now, it looks a little different in Acts chapter 2, but stay with me. When the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, they're empowered to speak other languages so that people visiting Jerusalem from other countries can understand what they're saying. A demonstration of God's power. But here's the thing. That was a rare, miraculous event, but the way the Holy Spirit usually demonstrates His power is not so much through miracles, but through the exceptional character of God's people. When we live by the Spirit, when we reflect the character of Christ, that gets the world's attention perhaps even more so than any miracle ever could. But it starts with a demonstration of God's life-changing power that people see in our character in the way we live our lives. But we can't stop there. We also need an explanation of God's life-changing power. We need actions and words working together to be witnesses to Jesus Christ. You see, actions, the demonstration of God's power has a remarkable impact and without the demonstration, the explanation, the words have absolutely no meaning. But the action, the demonstration by itself is, is vague, it's imprecise, it's subject to misinterpretation. We need to communicate and explain what people are seeing in our lives. We need people to understand that we are who we are because God has made us that way. After the arrival of the Holy Spirit gets the crowd's attention, there's some confusion. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. That's what happens when there's no explanation. People misinterpret God's power at work. If they don't know that you're a Christian... If they don't know you live the way you do because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, they may just conclude that you are just a nice person. Instead of glorifying your Father in heaven, they're glorifying you. But we need to direct the attention where the goodness really comes from. It's not us. It's the God at work in us. So we need to follow up the demonstration of God's power with an explanation of God's power. And that's exactly what Peter does. He says, no, no, these guys aren't drunk. They are empowered to do this by God's Holy Spirit, whom the prophet Joel predicted would be poured out in the last days. You're seeing the fulfillment of ancient prophecy right here in front of you. So Peter explained God's demonstration of power. We need to do the same. I live this way because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ because I have God at work in my life and within me, teaching me how to live. But then the next step after we've explained where this life-changing power comes from is an invitation to experience God's life-changing power for themselves. 
This isn't something we want to keep to ourselves. This is something that we've been called to share with others. After Peter offers his explanation for this demonstration of God's power, he extends an invitation. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He basically is telling them, look, if you want to experience God's life-changing power for yourselves, all you have to do is turn to God, put your faith in Jesus Christ, and receive the Holy Spirit. And thousands were added to their number that day. You want to talk about how to expand the family of God, this church we love so much. That's how it happens. A demonstration of God's life-changing power, an explanation of God's life-changing power, however brief, and an invitation to experience it for themselves. And it may not be quite so fancy as Peter's invitation was. It could be for you as simple as saying, hey, would you like to come to church with me? If you have a relation, that kind of relationship with a person. If you don't, continue working on connecting with that person until you do. But that's how it works. That's how God's influence expands, how God's kingdom expands. We have the responsibility to be witnesses to the kingdom's life-changing power. Demonstrated through our godly character. Explained when necessary to give it context, to keep it from being vague or misinterpreted. But most certainly an invitation of some sort, to experience God's life-changing power for themselves. Because when others see God's power demonstrated in your life, they will be interested in what you have. And when they're interested in what you have, they're more open to your invitation. And their encounter with you could be their first step in becoming the salt and light of the world for themselves. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your life-changing power at work in our own lives. We would be very, very different people if we had not experienced your life-changing power through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, through the example and the teaching of our Lord Jesus, through the life-giving community of your church. God, we pray that we would be open to be used by you as living demonstrations of your holy power, that we might be able to articulate for others where that goodness comes from, and that we might also have the courage and the wisdom to issue an invitation to others to experience that power for themselves. God, it can be scary. It can be awkward to be different. But God, you have called us to be different, to stand out to let our light shine. In Jesus' name.